Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers making archaeology accessible for the public. Currently, archaeology is a popular topic, and plenty of information is available in books, video documentaries, museum exhibits, curated collections, government offices, site tours, and other resources. These resources exist, but the information may not be realistically accessible for the people who want to know about archaeology. In this video, I will summarize how I would communicate the basic information about the archaeology of a region, using plain images, simple text, and ordinary speech that anyone can understand without specialized jargon and technicalities. Next, I will consider a few of the key issues that I have encountered when making this information accessible for the public. The example here looks into the Northwest Tropical Pacific, in particular in Guam and the Mariana Islands. Guam is the largest and southernmost of the Mariana Islands, and several islands extend roughly northward in two major arcs. The southern arc islands are older and larger, contain internal aquifers, and support more diverse natural habitats and resources. People lived in these southern islands at least since 1500 BC. By comparison, the northern arc islands geologically are younger and smaller, contain little or no permanent water sources, and support limited natural habitats and resources. People established permanent residential sites in these northern islands only after approximately AD 1000. In this case, these southern islands offer the best opportunities to learn about the most ancient sites of the Marianas region, and to convey a sense of the full chronological sequence of what happened ever since people first lived in these remote Pacific islands. Here I will concentrate on one site of Ritidian in northern Guam. At this site, I uncovered multiple archaeological layers that in total represented the whole chronological sequence of the Mariana Islands. Beneath the ground, each layer contained evidence from a different time period. The oldest, of course, was at the bottom, at least as early as 1500 BC, and the latest was at the modern surface, dating to the present day. For each layer, I could measure the time period by radiocarbon dating, and I could describe the evidence about the natural environment and the cultural setting. For people who visit the site today, nearly all of this information about the ancient past is hidden beneath the ground. Instead, the most immediate experience for people is with the site ruins on the ground surface. In fact, these surface visible site ruins are well known all throughout Guam and the Mariana Islands. The Retidian site in Guam is only one of many hundreds of sites in the region where these site ruins are accessible on the surface today. These sites, locally known as Lati, were made of stone pillars topped with capital stones, in turn supporting houses of wood and thatch construction. The Lati sites are celebrated as symbols of cultural heritage in Guam and the Mariana Islands. As archaeological evidence, the Lati sites refer to the date range of approximately AD 1000 through 1700. Therefore, they represent a later component of cultural history, overlaying more than 2,000 years of older archaeological evidence now hidden deeply beneath the ground in a limited number of spots. The remains of Lati houses and whole villages are abundant throughout the Mariana Islands, and many cultural traditions and historical references give more life and meaning to these sites. 
the indigenous Chamorro people of the Mariana Islands last used these sites as active residential habitations during the late 1600s. After that time, the Spanish conquest of the islands resulted in the abandonment of the traditional villages, and the surviving people were forced to relocate into other settlements under Spanish rule. Today, Lati are recognized as symbols of indigenous Chamorro culture and heritage. Stylized versions of Lati are found in license plates, coins, government iconography, and modern architecture. Along with the stone elements of Lati, most people today are aware of the range of artifacts that can be seen on the ground surface of Lati sites. Most people have seen examples of broken earthenware pottery, sling stones, grinding basins, fishing gear, and various stone and shell tools and ornaments. Part of what makes the Lati period so interesting for people today is not the archaeology evidence, but rather the overlap with written history and cultural traditions in the region. Written documentation first appeared here with Magellan's encounter in the year 1521. Written documents were sparse then and continuing for the next several decades, but they offered invaluable insights into the ancient life of that era. After 1668, the Jesuit missionary records and Spanish government records provided exceptional detail, including the final decades when people were living in traditional Latin villages. Returning to the example of the Retidian site in Guam, Lati ruins are visible on the surface today. Clusters of house ruins can be appreciated in their own right, and in connection with each other as a coherent village complex. Each house was made with individualized technical engineering and artistic expression. Broken pottery, other artifacts, and food remains are visible in different concentration densities, revealing more about the past use of the cultural space here. Excavations showed that the Lati village context was indeed the most recent overlay of cultural use of this landscape. In order to find deeper and older archaeological layers preceding the Lati ruins and preceding the written history contexts, I needed to look in other spots, outside the footprints of the Lati ruins. Indeed, a number of these spots revealed deeply buried layers, and the oldest evidence extended back at least to 1500 BC. These most ancient layers showed that people at 1500 BC lived along shorelines that were much different from today's conditions. The sea level had changed through time, and the shapes of the coastlines and nearshore habitats had transformed substantially. I linked my findings at the Retidian site with other observations around Guam and the Mariana Islands, and I illustrated overall how the island of Guam had changed through time. Within this model, I could situate the archaeological evidence in specific places and time periods. This approach allowed me to create a holistic model of how the natural and cultural landscape changed through time, in the chronological order of the archaeological evidence. Here is one of those models for the Retidian site in Guam. You can see how the physical landscape changed through time and how people adjusted to live in different locales through time. Moreover, I could use this chronological sequence to focus on any particular kind of archaeological evidence, such as the ancient pottery that was quite abundant in these sites. I could illustrate how the pottery changed through each time period. I could follow the same procedure for all of the other kinds of artifacts and findings, but the pottery sequence can communicate the major information for now. In order to make this information easy for everyone to understand, I like to show specific pieces of pottery in relation with the estimated full shapes of the pottery vessels. I like to insert silhouettes of human scale 
for easy reference, and people can imagine on their own about what the ancient people may have looked like. For public sharing and exhibits, I try to avoid overloading with too much detail. I want to encourage people to make their own observations, develop their ideas, and hopefully explore more. At this point in the video, you have seen a summary of how I would present the archaeology of Guam and the Mariana Islands, aimed at supporting a basic familiarity with the geographic location, time periods, and range of information in the archaeological record. I did not provide all of the details here in this video because anyone can access those details in other videos and resources. Now with this basic presentation at hand, I want to address a few key issues about making archaeology information accessible for the public. These key issues are applicable worldwide, and I will illustrate through the current example in Guam and the Mariana Islands. Again, I will focus specifically on the Retidian site in Guam as one useful real-life example, in this case addressing issues of collections storage and management, published results, museum exhibits, and site tours and experience. Collections management has become increasingly urgent in many regions of the world. While more and more archaeological materials are discovered, they need to be stored professionally and with attention to their unique characteristics and vulnerabilities. Physical storage, however, is only one important part of a formal curation program. Curation involves considerable effort in conserving precious materials, enacting long-term programs of learning and sharing information, and supporting public access to the materials. Ideally, archaeologists are involved in preparing the materials that go into a storage facility or a curation program. Most of this work is performed behind the scenes, outside public view, yet the results may be translated into publications, museum exhibits, and other output for the public. Published results in archaeology are necessary for documenting the primary data sets permanently in the literature. Even among professional archaeologists, though, the technical details can be overwhelmingly complicated and difficult to process as reading material. At best, these documents serve as records of information, with the potential for supporting new ideas and interpretations. For my research at the Retidian site in Guam, I produced several technical reports and academic publications, and then I made a holistic summary available as a free online PDF or on-demand printed version. Additionally, my colleagues in Guam wanted to produce a picture book about the Retidian site, as viewed from a modern perspective in Guam. These different formats of publications have allowed more diverse ways for people to access the information content. Museum exhibits are another effective way to communicate archaeology information with the public. For my work at the Retidian site in Guam, I made all of the information and all of the artifacts available for the staff and affiliates of the Guam Museum and my colleagues developed their own ideas of how to convey the information in a museum exhibit. As long as the information and the artifacts will continue to be available for the museum staff, then the new museum exhibits can adjust with the needs and express desires of the public visiting at the museum. In some cases, archaeology sites and their surrounding landscapes can be accessible for the public in programs of site tours and experience. One of those rare cases has been at the Retidian site in Guam, thanks to the support of Guam National Wildlife Refuge, part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Several trails guide visitors through different areas for learning and experiencing the natural and cultural history of this special place. Some of the trails are restricted for guided access, with trained staff as the guides, while other areas are open as public trails. The images here show one of the times when I guided the staff of the Guam Museum through one of the guided access areas. 
Since then, the museum staff have developed more of their own interests and ideas, and some of those results have been incorporated into exhibits and public outreach at the museum. Many other people of course visit the site regularly, including staff of the Guam Historic Preservation Office and other agencies, school groups of all ages, and visitors from overseas. Additionally, the site continues as a place of traditional cultural practice for collecting medicinal and therapeutic plants, connecting with ancestors, and many other purposes. All of those activities have enriched the ability to learn about the archaeology of the site and to translate the findings for the public. As long as access will continue at the site, then the program of site tours and experience will continue to grow and develop with the needs of the visitors and the ideas of the trained guides and traditional practitioners. Additionally, the free online PDF of the archaeology report and a free online video documentary of the site can extend the reach of the site experience for the public at a worldwide scale. In concluding this episode, now you should be familiar with some of the key issues for making archaeology accessible for the public. I offered just one example from my own work that you could adapt and apply in cases that are interesting for you. What are your interests? How would you manage these issues? And how would you improve public accessibility in archaeology? Please remember to subscribe to this channel, share with your friends, and explore more online videos with the Archaeology Studio.